wants to teach me. Are you free? You just said something that I have a theory on. So have you been your whole life a vivid dreamer? Do you have a lot of dreams? Yes. And your dreams yes. were very uh, colorful. Well, back then I had very colorful dreams. Not, well, now I don't think I have very colorful dreams. <laughs> <laughs> the, 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 and then you should, you, you should understand that Zurich, like uh, when I was a small child, Russian uh, Russians didn't make color films at all. The color films started, they started doing when I was a teenager already, because Russian films had no color. So the first color films were shown in Russia back then were uh, like, like Disney films and British films, which I probably thought that they were, uh, that were American too, because I couldn't understand the difference. But uh, it's uh, Alexander Cordes films like Thief right. uh, of Baghdad uh, and, and uh, uh, Mowgli, Book of Jungle, how it was called. Uh, right, yeah, the Jungle Book. Uh, so, Jungle Book, yes, Jungle Book. So that was the two color films which I could see besides of Disney. And for, so for this reason, I probably called my dreams American films. I don't know. You said something I really respected and I've read in, in these interviews. You moved to New York, but you, you just said, and you were talking in this interview, you didn't feel you could make a fiction film about New York until you had lived there for a while and you had had a sense. And one of the things that's so amazing about Liquid Sky is how it seems to really capture the late 70s, early 80s, downtown scene and how clear eyed it is on sort of the drug use and on sexual politics. I mean, to, to this day, we were all watching it. We were all stunned at how well your movie has held up for 40 years and how it looked at drugs and sexual politics and rock. And how did that all come about? Well, that's what, what, what I'm saying, that uh, I wanted to make film which would be a combination of the most theatrical and, and in conditional films, with most artistic, with most realistic. So, so it just happened that my friends were all members of this uh, because of because of my friendship and work with Bob Brady and his company. Always, uh, people were, were uh, because a lot of these people became my friends. Me and my wife actually were, were older than this crowd, and we spoke with accent, and we were from Russia. But none of, I don't remember that none of, that some, or anybody of these people would, would consider us foreign. They were friends. We were friends with them. Besides of that, I wanted, that was a real idea. Well, Anne Caroline, together with my wife, was a writer. And in a sense, she wasn't just a writer. She was a co-writer and a prototype at the same time. I mean, she, that's, uh, that's fantastic quality of Anne Carlyle. Some people are afraid to be open and use their own life. Anne Carlyle never had this shortcoming. He, uh, she really was ready to write about herself and open, open her own character and her own problems. So, from my and, and all the other characters there, we really used real people. I mean, sometimes we were inviting them for dinner or something like that, and provoking provoking them in the uh, closed situation in order to, to write down their lines and use them. Like this German guy came to us for dinner and brought wine with himself and brought German wife, uh, German wine, put it on the table and said, "Well." That's that's for you. That's what I drink. Exactly, the line is in the script. The line is in <laughs> liquid sky. So it's uh, that's how it works. We enjoyed it very much. Actually, I think the happiest time in my life was when we were writing script for liquid sky. We were laughing all the time. So after that, uh, uh, well, some people, I think not the wisest people, were saying that. 
Uh, laughs in liquids came out intentional, that we are not trying, to, we didn't try to make a funny film. That's not truth, because that I think I never laughed more than when we were writing script of liquid sky. It's always very funny. Uh, <laughs> so, no, it, actually, it, actually uh, probably, yes, probably film has less laughs than it should have, because people, all people around were all the time making me to cut out, out the laughs. So I think, hey, it's very serious. The person is killed here, and you're laughing. Why, why are you laughing here? The person is killed. <laughs> the, the, with Liquid yes. Sky, for, forgive me, I have so many so many questions. I don't mean to, and there's a delay, which is frustrating. I apologize. Um, the One of the things that we were all blown away by is what you just said which is that we we did find it very funny and we thought it was intentionally funny. And yet at the same moment, you could then turn it and it was very powerful how Anna Carlisle, how all these men, even in that scene and who maybe thought that they were hip or enlightened or artistic, were very brutal to her and weren't letting her be who she wanted to be. And I'm, I'm just wondering, and, and as you said, you know, and then even to have that clear eyed vision where her roommate, her friend ends up being very brutal to her as well. Another woman being brutal to her. Um, you were very intelligent in what you, you were just telling me you had your wife and Anna Carlisle as co-writers. Did you as a director want to make sure that you had a female viewpoint on the film since it so much had to do with maybe a female view of that time? How did you get that? Because it's such a strong, powerful female view. I tell you a story, how the story started. My wife, who, who learned filmmaking in the same school that I did, she's a critic and writer. She uh, was writing a script about a woman, a realistic film, a real script, which they were once made into film, about a woman who couldn't, couldn't have orgasm. She was finishing writing, and uh, she felt... Uh, not satisfied because she's from Russia, though she learned English in childhood, but still, uh, still she didn't feel, she felt that she needed somebody to help her with English. And Anne became fr our friend at that moment, as I said. So Anne moved with us to our loft, and they were working on the script. And every evening, then they were discussing uh, all this, you know, connected, uh, connected, uh, to the question of uh, all of this completely female, supposedly female problems connected to female orgasm, I was participating in the conversations like a listener, but at the same time, I was getting an idea for Liquid Sky. So these conversations kind of became uh, became a part of uh, part of my thinking as well, which wasn't. Uh, which wasn't uh, something unusual for me because I always was sharing all the feminist points of view. Really, really people were even calling me, even in Russia, were calling me feminist. So uh, it's not new for me. The most interesting here, which I'm tremendously proud of, then I was making shooting script alone. Some I went somewhere to 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 write to write to. Um, to Florida. And uh, I was writing, I felt that something is missing in the script. And I said that the script needs a monologue with all the ideas said in this monologue. So I wrote that this monologue myself. That's a monologue with, with this uh, 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 fluorescent makeup. Then I'm saying I came from Connecticut and all that. So I came being sure that Anne and Nina would change everything because you know that's a female problems monologue, and I wrote it alone. <laughs> and it and stayed didn't in. Change a word there. That's great. It's in the film exactly I wrote it. So so I am very proud of this monologue, uh, but I don't think anything strange about that because that's what I think that's what film directors work is about you need to be with your heroes you need to love them you need to feel their problems uh, together with them if you don't have it you just cannot make a good film that's and and that's the, you, you were talking yes yes i'm listening oh, I'm, I'm saying that i 
I think it's my, that's what I'm proud most of all of this ability to uh, to be close to my heroes. I mean, like in Russia, I was films about scientists, right? Then I went to Israel and made a successful film about uh, representative of Russian Orthodox Church. Then I came to America and made a film about punks. I mean, how can it be? It's so different subjects. And scientists loved my films in Russia. Uh, Russian, uh, uh, Russian believers uh, liked my film, in, in, uh, which I made in Israel, and Pounds liked my film, which I made in Liquid Sky. Why? I think there is no secret here. It's just I loved all my heroes. I, I could share their, I could share their feelings. You should love your heroes. You should, uh, you should share their feelings. If you love them, you can do it. If you don't love them, you can be great talent, but your film will be bad. If the director doesn't like the heroes of his film. Yeah, no, that's, inc that's incredible. That's incredible yeah. advice. Um, and, and so I wanted to ask you also, Mr. Suckerman, you were saying this earlier. The other thing we were blown away by, I mean, among many things in that film, and you've, you've hinted at it, is it was a low budget movie. You knew that you had half a million dollars. What advice do you give to people to make the most of low budget? Because you had that training. What are the mistakes you see people make? Uh, here's my question. I'll ask it simply. What advice would you give people to make the most if they have they just have two hundred and fifty thousand dollars? Let's say. What advice do you give them to make sure they do it right? a very good question and I have very good answer to this question. Not only me, I mean, I'm watching other people who make low, successful low-budget films, they all do the same, they all follow the same rule. You shouldn't try to compete with Hollywood because there is no chance you can make the, sa the same style film as Hollywood makes having no money which Hollywood has. You cannot compete. With. You need to use what you have. I mean, like I said, I use the actors I have. I use actually that I wrote uh, by uh, the script, which didn't happen, the Sweet Sixteen. Uh, the casting was most difficult casting of, a, of one of leading characters, like a, a, a scientist who is in film changing from 40 years old to 80 years old. The person who can could play a role like that from 40 to 80 years old, intellectual person. The person like that, very, it, it, it would be very, very difficult to find an unknown actor. You know, you need a, a person who can play a role like that is already famous. So then you, I found one, but that's uh, it's a different vision. It meant you can be happy and you you can be lucky and find anything, but you can actually you cannot plan film where you need to use elements which you cannot get for this mind. You need to use what uh, there is no like. I'm trying to some other. I don't want to to specifically use a name now, but so one of the person who made his first very famous low budget film. He just had an apartment for several months, so he knew that he should write a story which happened in his apartment. And he had like five actors, friends, who could play this month. So he wrote a script with, with a drama between characters which can be planned by these people. That's like that. You just use what you have, and then you can make it low budget. Make it. like like even with Liquid Sky, it has special effects. Not because I want the special effects very much, it's because I knew how to make low budget special effects. And I had director of photography who knew it. It was my plus that I had person who can do it. If I had no, I had I would I wouldn't do it. Right. right. So you should use what you have. Actually, that's a general rule, not only for low budget filmmaking. It's a rule for uh, for uh, for everything, for filmmaking in general. Uh, you you should use what uh, because filmmaking is very complicated thing. Uh, film director is it's probably the most one of the most difficult uh, jobs in the world. Why? Because film director is a person uh, responsible. For, uh, with, for for everything in the film. And it should all be in style, should be all 
part of one thing, right? But but he doesn't do it himself. Every role is played from different person. You know, made makeup made by different person. Music is made by different person. Uh, decorations made by different person. Locations are always different from what you had in your mind. And then you come to shoot these locations, and weather is completely different. So everything is against you. Besides of all these people who are involved, they have their own vision, and they as of all the normal people, they assure that the vision is better. You should convince them that, that your vision is their vision. And actually, the good directors do it very good. I, I really see that many times when people believe that they created something which really was given, given to them by a director. So, uh, so uh, it's, uh, it's the way it works. The director should make everybody believe that that belongs not to him, but to these people. And uh, it's difficult and not everybody likes it. So directors are different, but some directors are really behave like the Hitler. I mean, like just there's no other way for them to make people do what they want. Other people are really very smart and they uh, diplomatic and they cheat people manipulate them into doing what they need. But what, whatever way you do it, you need to, you, you need to make, make it yours. If you don't make it yours, if you don't keep all the style elements and everything, it will be a bad film. It's a, it's a condition of a good film. It's not necessarily, it should be a director. Some films are made by producers. Right. I mean, their personality is really an element. Like, going with, go with the wind. Had five or six directors who was working with their different. That's a David O. Selznick movie. So it's yeah, all right, right, because because he knew exactly what he wants, and he at every step he was getting the right person to make this part of the work. And finally, it's a really very good film. It's possible. It's possible to make it this way, but it's impossible to make it without the person who knows exactly about the event what he wants. <laughs> But but as we head into the final five or ten minutes, um, there's so many questions I want to ask you, and you've been a very giving person, and 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 um, and I want to thank you. This is exactly what our community needs to hear uh, for so many things. But one thing that I wanted to ask you is, you have that experience of having lived in several cultures and several countries, and also you've lived through the history that has shaped this current moment. And I'm just wondering, do you think, uh, did that bring, I don't even know how to ask the question, but most of us just live in the country we live in. And we might travel a little bit, but we don't have that perspective of having lived in other cultures and seeing common humanity. What was it that you learned having grown up in Soviet Russia then moving to uh, 1970s uh, United States. What, do you, what did you learn living in both those societies? What kind of perspective did you gain? Well, it's a, it's a very general question. I really don't know what, what really you mean. Uh, in a sense, I was prepared back in Russia to, it's again part of my personality. I'm open to different cultures. I understand that world is uh, complex and I understand that uh, there, is no, uh, there is no black and white in life. There is no black and white in art. Uh, and uh, there are different points of view. Actually, I never, uh, I'm not judgmental. That's, uh, so for me, it was natural uh, to accept the different culture. I don't know. I mean, it more, it's much more difficult to learn to learn foreign language than foreign life. <laughs> I can I can, right now at this point of my life, I can teach people how to do it. What what's the rule you should follow in order to learn learn language? It's how long did it English, take you, you know, to? How long did it take you to learn and read and write English? Well, you see, I was I was learning it in many years in Russia. I was uh, the results are very bad, but something I knew, and uh, and then I followed several uh, uh, several uh, uh, rules how to do it. Uh, the, besides of that, I knew that uh, you learn not by memorizing something; you learn by 
by uh, swimming, you jump into the into the water and swim. Right? That's that's how it's done. And then I came to America. I started working for Radio Liberty, broadcasting to Russia, American American radio broadcasting to Russia. And I was working like freelancer. I was writing Jewish programs, some other programs. But uh, summertime, everybody left for vacation, and they needed somebody to write news. And the editor said, can you write news? And you know, one thing which I learned already after immigration to Israel, and somebody asked you, if you can make any job, you never tell them you cannot do it. You always tell them, yes, I can. That's how you get to You cannot get to for telling people you already went through that. So I said, yes, of course I can write news. Then he gave me cuts from the papers, from, you know, like from... Uh, New York Times, Boston Globe, uh, Wall Street Journal, and so on, from all the top papers about economics in the United States this year. And said, write a news about economics this year, in Russian, write a news. I knew nothing about economics, never been interested. I've never been interested in politics and read newspapers. So then I, then I opened these articles. I couldn't understand one word. I just couldn't understand what's that about. But I didn't tell him anything. I just tried to to follow another rule, write it and try to understand something and use, use a dictionary only then. I see this word is really the most important, right? Not, not to watch every word in, in dictionary because then you wouldn't read even one article. You just, it's impossible. So I just tried to get the idea and I wrote my news. He read this news, he got green, I mean, he got mad, absolutely, because it was opposite to reality. I mean, like uh, economics in the United States was growing, and I wrote opposite that it was falling down, right? <laughs> he just like, he couldn't understand this article. So, but he understood that he gave me the most difficult work. Nobody wanted to do it, right? He gave to one who never did anything. <laughs> At all, he just gave the most difficult job that was around. So he changed everything and gave me another job easier. And for three months, for three months, I was writing like two news a day. And after the three months, I took New, uh, New York Times in my hand and I discovered that I easily read it. Huh. I read New York Times. The, the, <laughs> because I, I, never, I never tried to memorize. I just tried to understand what I'm uh, reading in order to write about it. Right. right. In Russia. I, 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 I learned, but I learned on these words. I became, I, I, I easily read American papers after three months of working. I never, I, it wasn't studying. I didn't memorize anything. I was just trying to write. So that that's the way how to learn. The other thing, speaking. I had the first First, our friends were couple from El Paso. Uh, the wife was the wife was uh, learning Russian in the university. That's why they uh, it produced to to us because we will be able to speak Russian with them. I never spoke Russian with them. I spoke with them only English. And even I visited their parents with them for for several for, for some holidays. I don't remember what holidays in El Paso. I went to El Paso, was passed with his cousins in his cousin's home. Everybody spoke English with Texas, Texas accent. So I came to the place where I couldn't understand a word what people were speaking, saying there are no, no Russians anymore, nobody could translate. <laughs> I, need to, I need to survive not understanding what people are telling me. <laughs> And then in a couple of weeks, I started this with speaking with them and understanding. So that's that's the main rule. The main rule you need you need just to in order to learn how to swim, you need to jump into the water and swim. <laughs> and no other rule. The, the, uh, we yeah we, we but we all need to hear it again and again. It's it's I. Uh, uh, it's funny what you're saying. My wife did just real quick. My wife is Salvadorian. I speak Spanish. And I went down to El Salvador to meet her parents. And it was the same thing for the Salvadorian Spanish accent was almost like the Texas accent. It's not the easiest Spanish accent to understand. But by the third day, because 
I couldn't do anything else. No one spoke English. By the third day, I was able to follow it a little bit. But it's, <laughs> you just got to get used to it. My final question to you, Mr. Suckerman, for today is, we ask this of every filmmaker we interview. Uh, given your experience, what advice would you give filmmakers starting out today? What have you learned? What wisdom can you pass on for people who are determined to make a career in film expression, who believe in cinema? Because it's a very hard profession to do and a very hard profession to make your life out of. What, what advice would you give? Advice is to know that the main thing which you need, we need to have a real desire and devotion. Actually, I knew a lot of people who, uh, like in, were in film school with me, are not shooting film school, were very talented, everybody knows that they were talented, because there are so many, uh, so many difficulties so not on the way or on the way that you try to be a filmmaker, that people just stop doing it. They they understand that they cannot go through all that. It's uh, uh, the big. Uh, there are a couple of big mistakes. So one mistake is that you think that you're talented and it's a pleasure. It's a fun, right? Because the fun is a very small percent of shit. Most of that uh, hard hard job to get what you want. And the second thing, people think that it's a, it's a beautiful life <laughs> among the stars. And these people leave the profession very fast because they understand there is nothing glamorous about being a filmmaker. I mean, uh, life is not uh, red carpet. That's, uh, most of filmmaking is not red carpet. <laughs> so, so you need to know, and I knew people who had no much talent but became pretty successful filmmakers because they knew that they loved filmmaking so much and they were ready to sacrifice everything, just make films. They finally learned how to make not bad films. I mean, the complete devotion and desire to make film, it should be number one. You should, if it's a number one for you and you are ready to spend your life fighting for that, then you'll be a filmmaker. That's, that's my advice. Another advice, you know, people, young people very often ask me to go to film school or not to go to film school. I mean, film school mostly uh, important because you have a company there with, with which you communicate, you are not alone in the, but not for learning uh, actual skill. Uh, in order today, today I would I don't know. I mean, everyone can shoot film with his own telephone. You don't need anything but telephone. You can you can even edit film on telephone. Not speaking about the computer, it's fantastic. You need nothing to make film now. So make your films. That's the main thing to make films. If you don't know how to do it, you always have a lot of books to read about that and a lot of people who can give you advice. Uh, then you, if in film school, you probably have more people who can teach you these things. But again, that's not the main thing. The most famous directors never went to film schools. <laughs> don't, don't forget it. That practically all the genius directors never went to film schools. It, uh, to, to learn the uh, important skill elements are easy for some people, more difficult for other people. But today, again, it's very, very easy because everybody has video. You can have classic films and watch them a million times, stopping them, uh, studying everything in them. And, you know, it's very easy to learn art. In my time, it was much more difficult. It was before video. I mean, to study a film, you need to have 35 millimeter copy and a, a, a editing table. You, need, you, know, you couldn't watch it without that. Wow. Well, I, I just want to... I, I want to thank you for your kindness and generosity of spirit and, uh, and for your insights. And for, you know, I want to... I know you probably hear this all the time, but I want to congratulate you on making, I think, the rarest of movies, a movie that transcended its time. And I just want to share with you again, we had a lot of people in the audience and everybody stayed after the movie to talk about your film and how blown away they were by your film, how unique it was, how it still spoke to them today, 40 years later. 
So thank you for giving your time to us today uh, to talk uh, about Liquid Sky and about movies. Okay. Keep us posted. Thank okay, you, Mr. I Suckerman. Know, I don't know if it's... Okay. Okay, bye-bye. Talk to you soon. Bye.